So welcome everyone. I think we're slowly starting to gather the number of attendees. Um, just a quick introduction and welcome message from Ransa Sourcewright at the next episode of our Talent Navigator series, uh, where we're gonna talk about the three talent trends in the banking and financial services and about navigating the seismic cultural shift and new talent expectations. We have with you our host of this afternoon, morning or evening, wherever in the world you are, Sam Schlimper, uh, our consulting principal at Ransa Workforce Advisory. So Sam, the floor is yours and enjoy your next hour. Right, so maybe we should start because we have one hour to um, talk about a massive topic, I think. Um, and as Attila said, we are talking about talent trends that have come up in our research around in banking and financial services and insurance, really supercharging digital skills, acquisition and retention, but broadly around what those talent trends are in these changing times and how we can navigate those murky waters. Um, so it's super interesting topic this afternoon. And um, what I would like to do first is uh, introduce my uh, my speakers who will be with me this afternoon. So I'm really appreciative. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, two speakers who are highly experienced in this area, but also highly passionate. I can tell you that we've had conversations around this. And so really will be great to get their perspectives, learn from their experience and hear their points of view. Um, and um, I'll do a quick intro on all of us and then we'll um, dive into, into the topics. But the agenda will go, that we'll talk through those topics and at the end we'll have a Q&A. So please, 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 we would like to have this as interactive as possible. Don't be shy, get your questions ready and we'll leave time at the end to either take different perspectives, get questions and, and hear your points of view. So um, let me first of all enjoy, uh, introduce Nia Patel. Nia, um, Nia leads recruitment for Prudential's insurance companies. She's also responsible for the company's DEI recruitment strategy and heads the team responsible for building strong external partnerships, brand awareness, and inclusive internal processes to attract diverse talent to the company. So we are so delighted to have you here. Really looking forward to hearing your perspectives, Nia, and welcome. And then David Jones. David is the head of HR, talent management and diversity, equity and inclusion for Collar Capital, one of the world's leading investors in the secondary market for private assets. And prior to joining Collar, David was the head of leadership, learning, talent and DNI and at Barclays Bank UK, leading a progressive talent agenda to digitize the bank's workforce and leadership teams. So welcome, David. Um, I will do an intro to myself um, briefly, and you will see that uh, David and I worked together prior as colleagues, and so um, looking forward to hearing your perspectives too. So um, as Attila said, I am Sam Schlimper. I work in Randstad's workforce advisory business, where we have the privilege of consulting with organizations all the way from their talent aspirations using experimentation and co-design to solve those complex and real challenges to practical talent strategy creation connected to business strategies and how that actually works in practice in organizations and then also benchmarking and advice on their talent offerings including process people data technology so i'm really privileged to have that um that role um, simplicity is at the top of one of our principles in our team um, and talent intelligence underpins and kind of powers our engagement. So the themes that we're going to discuss today are very close to our hearts and our minds. Um, prior to joining Randstad, I was a head of talent acquisition for Barclays, where I led the professional hiring offering, uh, was the custodian of the talent attraction and selection and assessment approach, as well as have worked across many areas of the bank, all the way from investment banking and markets, cards and payments and consumer banking um, in multiple uh, geographies. So that is a little bit about our background. If we dive into to the agenda, I think because it's such a changing world that we work in at the moment, and there is no certainty in terms of what's going to happen next, everyone wants to know what should I be thinking about, how should I be thinking about it? I think it's a really good time to, to have this type of, of interaction um, and the research to really help us think about that and to, to navigate what can be super confusing and super complex. So 
I just think I should spend a little bit of time talking about the Talent Trends research. Um, as it says on the slide, in its seventh year and really assists human capital leaders to drive their business agility and help with their talent strategies and getting results. Um, it's, I think, important to know that 900 C-suite and human capital leaders took part at international and regional organizations and in key industries, of course, banking and financial services being one of them, but also technology, high value manufacturing and life sciences across 18 markets. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the robustness, the breadth of the research and therefore where these um, talent trends came from. So let's dive right in and go into the first talent trend. And again, I'm not sure these will be surprising to any of you, but it's, it's really how things are moving forward. That first talent trend is evolving talent strategies with data, AI, automation, and RPA. And again, not surprising, but 76% of employers believe that internal talent analytics plays a critical role. I'm sure those of you in talent analytics will be pleased to hear that. In sourcing, attracting, engaging, and retaining talent. So, I, David, I'm actually going to come and ask you first, just in terms of that, in your experience and just what you've, your thoughts and sharing with other leaders in the industry, how do you think as human capital leaders, we can further leverage data and insights to create that agility and drive value? So it's, it's a complex issue because I think HR as a function within a business is just beginning to really embrace the power of analytics, data, um, um, AI, etc. And I was pleased to see that 76% of people said it's going to play a critical role. I think I thought about this in three ways, really, from my perspective. One of them is actually, are we really sure that we're asking the right questions? Are we really clear on what the right issues and problems are? Traditionally, when people have thought about HR analytics, it's been a set of reports that tell you how many people are in your organization, what your attrition rates might be like, et cetera, and may extend it into some diversity statistics. That gives you a very surface level, and actually we really need to begin to think beyond that. So I, the first thing I would say is, as leaders within HR, we really need to be very clear about what, we, what those problems, what those issues are, and make sure that we're asking the right questions as in how we go about solving them. So it moves it slightly away from actually, we've got to have a whole load of skills, but actually let's be really clear on what those diagnoses are that we need to have need to happen to help us really think about where we drive value to the business. The second part I would say is we need to be really clear and really confident then that we have the right data. And I know data integrity, data um, quality is an issue in many organisations. And I certainly reflect back to my time at Barclays and some of the challenges that we had in making sure that the data was correct, it was right, etc. It was from reliable sources. So, you know, that's the first part. But, you know, being able to recognise whether or not data is good or bad is a really essential part of the role I think that we play. Mm -hmm. And then I think we have to challenge ourselves as to where actually perhaps we might get data from. Um, and I would encourage us all to think about actually what are perhaps some correlating data sets that we might want to then run alongside our own people analytics that we have here to begin to go back a much more holistic picture as to what might or might not be going on within the business. And I would say the other part of that would be challenge yourself actually who can help you do it. Quite often because we think it's people and sensitive data, we hold it to ourselves. And we, we aren't going to have all the answers. Actually, who else is out there within the business, potentially, or elsewhere, that might be able to help us really make sense of what the data really is telling us and get really to that holy ground of true insight as to what's going on and what are the things that you need to do to tackle those issues and problems that may be identified. And then the first part I would say for us as human capital, third part I would say for human capital leaders is actually make sure that you have the right skills in place to be able to do this. Um, if you think about some of the traditional routes that we take to get to the jobs that we're doing, mm -hmm. data and analytics doesn't feature as part of that. Um, it's a new skill, a new competency that I actually do believe that all HR people should be embracing to one step or another. Make it a core competency when you're hiring people, I think is really important to say, actually, are you able to work with data and derive insight? And then, I would, I would say really in that, so if you haven't got the right skills in-house, who can you partner with? And there's some great partners out there that you know really do push the boundaries of how HR should be managing, manipulating, driving insight from data. 
you're going to learn a lot from that. Um, and I think that will help you then really leverage data to a far better level to where we are currently at the moment and really then help you focus and pinpoint your strategy to drive value where it really can be driven. I totally agree, David. I think um, it's interesting. I am. Um, I think the word is evolution, right? Because I think everybody's on um, kind of moving along that mm. and are at different places. I think when we talk to organizations um, across the globe in this, it's really fascinating to see where they are, what they're moving to. But one of the key commonalities that comes out in those who are really getting a return on investment, and you spoke about where's the data coming mm. from, is interrogating that. It's the commonality of how they behave to work with that data and to kind of highlight some things that may be sacred in the organization, challenge it, keep it, mm -hmm. decide what you're doing with that. But it's one of the common threads of behaviors that we see across those organizations who really are, are turning the dial. I think the other thing, I'm um, just connecting it back and you spoke about skills. I think one of the things that digital talent expects, which again, it sounds really obvious, is they expect digital tools, right? Mm -hmm. So, and they expect digital data. So when they come into an organization, what are they going to get in that front? And where we see organizations moving from that is not just from a process perspective, because I think that's often where we go to is we design the process with those things in mind and where should automation be and how should that human and automation come together. But what is data from an HR perspective doing to help them mm -hmm. as individuals in terms of what's important to them? Um, and so I think you spoke about how do you think about that up front? How do you calibrate that? How do you work with that? How is data, where is it coming from? How is it analyzed? Who's interpreting it? And, and what behaviors do you put around that data to drive things forward? Yeah, I, I kind of describe it as almost like data translation, really. Actually, how do you make sense of the data and then actually be able to articulate that in a way to the business to actually get them to sit up and take notice and listen? I, I, I'm sure many of you may have had similar experiences to me where you're presenting your HR statistics to your board or your executive committee and you do get the guys that gloss over because it's it doesn't feel fresh or new and so yes, there's an attrition issue or yes, we've got these things here, but you've got stuff that's fixing that. I'm much more interested in actually talking to the business about actually, if you put these pieces of data together and insight together, here's actually where the debate should be for us to have. And I think that, that creates far more interest in our, our partnerships with the ex executive committees that we work alongside with. Yeah, um, and, uh, absolutely. And I think one of the things we see again with people who are really seeing a, a, a big difference in this is, they're very purpose driven in mm -hmm. how they're thinking about it and who the data serves. Mm -hmm. So I guess a question to ask yourselves on uh, and think about in your organization is the data that you're getting, who is it serving and for what purpose? Mm -hmm. And it's going back to that and, and really thinking about that as to, and how is it helping make decisions against your strategic objectives moving forward? Yeah. So yeah, I, I, it was just, it, it was observations that I'd seen in talking to organizations in our industry across the globe uh, in different areas. And, and I think that's such a good point, Sam, that you make there is actually, the, 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 whom are you serving as a function, I think is a really fundamental question to, to, to ask yourself, because I think that applies to all disciplines of HR really. And actually quite often I've seen in the past where you design policy process and practice for HR and not necessarily for the businesses or the colleagues that you're serving. I think it's a really important part of when you're thinking about the questions that you want data to answer is actually so what actually this will be serving to that business or that colleague or that, or that leadership team. Yeah, completely agree. Great. If we have a look on the, the slide at those talent trends, uh, it was just interesting for me when I looked at the benefits um, that, that kind of came out as the top benefits on the right hand side. If you have a look, 41% spoke about great efficiency and consistency. And so it goes, but it feels like efficiency and consistency are still at the top of the pile in terms of where we as HR see that being super valuable. Um, and I guess, and, and particularly now we're in this, you know, can we find some some cost savings? Where is our efficiencies? And and I guess, yeah, let me ask you, have we got the balance right, do you think, in terms of sustainability and the kind of 
people being at the center of design with experience and then cost and efficiency? How do you, how do you see that? How do you experience that? I think it's a it's a pendulum and I don't know that anyone has really gotten it right and I think to David's point Sam I don't I think this is still fairly new in HR I think we're still trying to figure out how best to use the data and analytics to get to where we need to um I think there's still a lot of us trying to figure out do we have the right tech stacks do we have the right tools um are we using the data in the simplest way possible to, to tell our story or are we just creating reports for the sake of creating them. So I think the answer I think is that I don't know that anyone has truly figured out how do we use some of the data and analytics and the capability in HR um, to its fullest potential. But I do agree with some of the survey results that I'm seeing here that um, does it add greater efficiency, consistency? Absolutely. Um, I can say from a prudential standpoint, we work very closely with our fantastic partners and our employee insights team in HR technology that allow us to really look at the data in a meaningful way and make decisions. <laughs> Um, that help us move faster. Amazing. I am um, just coming back to, to that as well. And and David, something you said earlier, I also think that we, we've spoken a little bit about data. The tech stack is, you know, it's an ever evolving. Mm -hmm. It's uh, again, uh, probably one of the biggest questions that people ask me in my workforce advisory capacity, like what, what's happening, what's in the future, what's out there, what can I not see, what, how do I really um, kind of embrace that and in what way. Um, and I just think, um, David, something you said is, as we go through these changes, often there's a sort of, of course, there's a business case for change around things which are related to efficiency. But where we've seen it sometimes unravel is, you need to then up who's looking after your technology and your data, right? So there's a change of focus is you're moving away from transactional repeatable work to doing meaningful work and you need to maintain and constantly improve with your technology team and your your data analytics team so shout out to those teams you know uh, yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> but, but hr careers are are changing but what what we used to do in the past and what we are required to do i, I think are so fundamentally different and i think you know we have to embrace um, AI automation and RPAs to help us do our jobs more efficiently. I, I look at it, you know, human beings really aren't designed to do the same thing over and over again. We get bored, we make mistakes, we get distracted, etc. So if you can take that away, those repeatable, constant tasks that need to get done, but actually are, you know, ripe for potential error, why wouldn't we embrace that? I think that's absolutely correct. But on the flip side of that, then, I think we really then need to think about then what else is that we introduce into the into the HR service offering. And I think this really, for me, just offers up a, 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 a great opportunity to really do the human side of HR and really think about actually candidate experience, people experience, employee experience, talent experience, really be getting to know the workforce far more efficiently, being there at those moments that actually matter, I think really is important. And then the, the, the bots and the um, automation can deal with the churn. There's no problem at all with that. That's great if you're, it's efficient and, and, and being done. And the data that you get that will really help you enhance and improve that service. But for me, this has got to be an opportunity through efficiency to really to think about where we really add value from consultancy to advisory to start thinking about the future. This is where you know, HR people need to be much more creative, much more innovative, I think, in this particular space. And this technology, this data allows us, should allow us to be able to do that. And I think for me, um, the word care just comes up time and time again. It allows us really to do stuff that makes a big difference to employees and also to our clients and our customers that we are serving ultimately that we do care and therefore we enable that then to help us retain more effectively and, and really find pathways for the future and capitalize on that talent that you know may be hidden in your organization. Right. David, I think I just want to add something here, Sam. David, I think what goes hand in hand with that, I couldn't agree more, is the piece that I think you mentioned earlier on about um, just making sure that we have 
that that HR professionals have those skills then to be able to execute and show um, you know, progress through these efforts, right? So as we think about our tech stacks, we think about you know being able to enable some of this work using the data and analytics to uh, become more efficient in what we do. We need you know the people within HR to have the skills necessary to be able to use those resources, to be able to use some of those analytic tools that are being offered. And so I think it really goes back to sort of looking at what, what you have, how are you going to use it, and then making sure that it's actually executed against it. Because having all of this information is of no use if you don't have people on the seats that can do, um, that can actually utilize this and for better decision making. Absolutely. Yeah. Completely right. agree. I mean, I am... Um... I think I agree with both of you, and it leads us nicely into our next uh, trend. I think the only thing I wanted to add to that is, is what a wonderful thing, right? What a great thing for us to be released from doing that type of work and really adding value. And it also, where we've seen some great organizations do this well, is it allows the people to proactively reach into their employees and really have those very different conversations rather than constantly on the back foot. So if we move into that second uh, talent trend, um, so, and I, I think we could all talk about this for a very long time because we feel super uh, passionate about it, is triumph with a flexible people first employee experience. I'm not going to read the data because it's on the slide for everyone to see, but I guess, um, yeah, let me come and ask you about this because I know it's at your, it's at your core and your heart is how have you, how can companies elevate that talent experience in terms of nurturing talent? It talks about loyalty and satisfaction, but really well-being, all of those great things. Yeah, I think you're right, Sam. I feel passionate about this space because we're at such an interesting time um, as, as we're coming out of some of that post-pandemic uh, return to work. You know, everybody's trying to figure out how do we bring employees back? Do we keep them virtual? Should we do a hybrid environment? And so, as we're thinking about all of those questions, you know, where and how do we, you know, how do we care best for that employee experience? And I think for me, um, when I think about this, I, I always, I always say that you've got to you've got to have trust in your employees it all starts there right um we have to make sure that whatever decisions we're making we're making as we think about what the future of our companies are going to look like what is that future of work what is that um you know future um state for us and organize as an organization look like and then going back to saying okay well then how should this return to work and flexibility um hybrid environments really fit into what we're trying to do um but but foundationally i think it starts with trusting your employees um knowing that if you do a hybrid environment um it's okay um, to have someone not come in to the office that week, um, knowing that for two years, um, all of us were working virtually and we were able to keep, you know, the lights on in our companies. So um, there's that, I just don't want us to lose some of those lessons learned that each of us are coming out with from this pandemic and, and making sure that we incorporate that as we think about long-term. Um, one other point I'll make, and then, you know, maybe if uh, David, you want to add anything else is, um, you also have to, as leaders, I feel, um, be agile. You have to listen. Um, things are not always going to be the same for every employee. Um, the, you know, situations are going to be different from what they were in two or three years ago coming back to work. Um, some, you know, we have employees, even within my team, that absolutely love to come into work. They want to come into work. They, they like the people interaction. And then there are others who really are just barely trying to manage and, and would prefer an all virtual environment. So I think it's really on the leaders to listen, to pivot, to understand the feedback, and then marry that with some of our company's priorities to say where, where and how do we fit all of this in to ensure a strong employee experience. Completely agree. I mean, I think the key message for me is that one size does not fit all. And if that's that's the reality of the world that we're in. So we're trying to design something that is trying to smish 
people into a into a, a channel or a tube I think you're instantly then um, beginning to unwind actually ultimately what you're trying to do which is create a culture and a employee environment that really makes sure that you keep the right people you develop those people and they've got the opportunities to thrive so again what I would be would be saying in this particular instance is actually you know leadership is key completely agree with Nia it's absolutely key the, the ability for them to understand the why of their people that work for them is ever more critical help me understand why you come to work each day and then help me become a better leader to you so then we can get the best out of you as an organization I think those are the kind of questions that sometimes often get forgotten because of traditional management hierarchies and traditional ways in which we view work and I think more and more what we'll begin to see is a, a challenge over actually what does the what does the what does the word job actually mean what is what is a job and how do you how do organizations need to perhaps rethink what a job is and in terms of we, we we design everything at the moment with a very traditional way of working so we've got headlines of hybrid flexible working yet quite often contracts are very very binary they talk about monday to friday nine to five thirty policies are designed in the same way the way in which people set up meetings are very much designed in you know a traditional normal working pattern and it doesn't take into consideration the individuality of people i, I completely yeah. get it you you want to monitor and you want to um ensure that people are producing that comes back to me again is that's what a great leader is it's there to understand the why of people strengths weaknesses and make sure that the right level of coaching communication direction is in place in order to maintain those standards of performance but it puts a lot of pressure onto leaders and we've never trained them in this way the pandemic has flipped things around for people to actually how they like to work their expectations as what they need from an organization and I think we're lagging a little bit behind in getting leaders up the curve in terms of their skills their ability to, to navigate a much more complex um, workforce a much more complex talent pool with very very different expectations is what they want from organizations and also from leaders you know, I, I I think yeah we just need to make sure that we you know we are really clear about who we're designing the process and the experience for as well it's, yeah. it comes back to that again and making sure that it's got the right flex the ambidexterity in it to 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 adjust and pivot when the world changes around us which i have no doubt it will do over the next you know, period that we're on this planet yeah, I, yeah. sorry yeah did you want to i was just going to say one thing that i i think that it's and after the companies do make that decision i think it's also important for them to understand, you know, the potential challenges that may arise from whatever decisions you make, right? Yes. So being aware of that, right? If you decide that for five days a week, we're going to require employees to come into work, then you have to accept the fact that you might lose talent and potentially uh, talent in certain sectors, females, um, diverse mm -hmm. talent. Um, that may not be able to do the five days a week um, coming back um, to work. So I think it's important to understand your philosophy around this and, and execute against it, but also potentially the challenges that may come after the fact in terms of your, you know, uh, talent in-house as well as in attracting new talent. Yeah. I, I, and you have to be consistent, right? There's no point in having a glossy website or a job uh, profile that says we're flexible, we, we do this, we, we develop, we do all this, and they actually, the actual experience it in, on the ground is completely different to that. And you know, consistency is, is absolutely key. Why would from day zero look and feel any different to day 180 or day 365 or day 500, etc.? You have to be consistent, you have to stay core, true to those core values, be transparent, be upfront. And if you do make the decision to go five days as Nia has said there are there are consequences to that if you're comfortable with it then be true to that and communicate that really clearly and be clear about actually what else you might need to do then to um retain and, and and attract talent in it'll cost you more money I think but you know if that's what you want to do then that's fine yeah I I agree I, I cannot tell you I don't think there's one conversation I've been in in workforce advisory where this mm. hasn't come up so this is like the hottest topic and you know everyone's kind of like what what's everyone else doing what should we be doing all of those things apply I, I think what 
and you've spoken about some of these, what I've seen is common in all of those conversations is there isn't an answer that's going to fit into a box that you can go, great, tick, move on. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Second thing is, as we've spoken about, it is still evolving. So this isn't a done thing, right? This is this is in progress, this is evolving. And the third thing is how much time, energy, and effort is going into kind of this, this part mm -hmm. of people's thinking and what have you. And I think that's also because individuals, every single one has a preference and experience. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they bring it to bear and then we're all making decisions, which David, you touch on, brings us back to the first point. Where are you getting your information from? How, what information is being amplified and what's not and why? And who are you designing for here? Are you designing for the mass? Are you designing for particular skills? Are you designing for certain personas? Are you designing for your executive leadership? Are you, who are you actually designing for at the, at the kind of core and purpose? And it, it, I, I want to link back all the behaviors we see with some of the organizations who are really getting some traction. They're very clear on that. Mm -hmm. And then, like you both said, there are implications to that, but they are clear on why those implications and they're able to talk about that with their organization. Um, I think the other thing that, um, you know, we touched on, and it's, uh, again, one of the common behaviors we see with firms is, and I'm going to put it out there as a hypothesis, and I'll give a view and then appreciate your thoughts. This is a symptom. It's not a root cause, right? So, um one of those common behaviors of great organizations is yes you've got to deal with the symptom and the immediate pain but if you don't deal with the root cause we'll be here for a long time trying to solve things because you've got to regulate it and then this and then it's not fair and how and all of those things actually the hypothesis that we put forward to some of our clients is you know what is the root cause of this and um i think we I think David, you touched on it and perhaps you as well, Nia. It's like that redesigning of work is the thing, right? That is the root cause. We've got to redesign the way we go about doing work um, and reimagine how some of the worries that people have are real. So how am I, how am I, how's a new person going to integrate into who we are, right? How is that going to happen? How do we reimagine a way of doing that? What parts of our work have require us to really focus? And let's be honest, in the office, and I think there's research done that says it's quite an unfocused place unless you've got people sitting with their headphones trying to hide in a corner, right, away from <laughs> everyone else. So there are times when focus and concentration is super important, and there are times when actually having those interactions, and we are social beings. So it's reimagining work on those constructs rather than in the these are the outputs of the job that we see people starting to experiment with and think about that whilst dealing with the, the short term. And I guess the question for some of the folks on the, it's like, where are you at the moment? Where are you spending your time and energy? And particularly now when things get constrained, we tend to move towards the short term, let's fix this. Have you got enough time, resource, energy on the longer term root causes? But and it causes great tension. So I'd be interested in your in your um, perspectives in a, in a short in a short proceed version is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, I suppose my my reflection is I I think we spent an awful lot of time as a HR function talking to businesses about actually what the policy should be, um, whether it's five five four one three two two three or none at all. And we've not really thought about actually what does the what's the right way to tackle how we get the best out of our employees. Um, and I think um, we've tried to police it and put a policy in place without really spending that time thinking about actually how do we get create the culture, the environment where people really can perform highly and thrive in, in an organisation, we've gone straight to policy. And I think this is where, for me, if the data is telling us prior to COVID, we were working quite happily with a more flexible pattern. If we've got engagement results that are saying I have flexibility, why are we trying to constrain that right now um, in, in this space? And I, I suppose the cynic in me is, you know, what, ask yourself what you did before. COVID because I think COVID is, is sometimes a little bit of a there's a lot of emotion that sits with that there's a lot of 
change that sparked and I don't want to underestimate that, but let's think about where the pra best practice was before and then reflect about how then you might translate that through to the to the present day. Um, I think, you know, expectation has changed. We, 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 we can't approach the problem in the same way in which we, we've done previously before. It has to be, let's design for our people so we, they feel loyal, they feel invested in, and they feel they have a sense of duty as well then to actually go the extra mile for us. Design it for, design it for your workforce, don't design it for a, a policy. That's where I would be starting. Great. I want to move us on to the last talent train because I know both of you and I'm going to try and stay less and, and listen more to, to you on this one. But um, I think it's both it, it's in your job titles and also in your mm -hmm. your kind of hearts. Right. So this is the third trend. And again, not surprising, making diversity, equity and inclusion your strength. And I think it is in that it mm -hmm. make it your strength. Um, and and we've been doing this for a long time. Right. So. Um, like it's it's a super important should be embedded in all of those things and Nia, let me come in and ask you this this question how are you making sure that those initiatives that you do have are getting results how and how do you think about that yeah um so yes um i um for for this group uh, joining today i lead the dei recruitment strategy within talent acquisition for prudential and you know the one thing i say to hiring teams to our executive leaders to within talent acquisition is um work is hard you know everyone is passionate about it every company wants to do it at least on paper right okay. but it's hard it's hard and it's a lot of work where it's difficult to see the ROI unless you are putting an intentional effort against that. And so my advice always in the DEI space is if you're going to do it, do it. Don't haphazard. There's no 50%. There's no 70%. You go all in. It's either you're in or you're out. Otherwise, it's fluff. You know, and I said that yesterday um, to you, Sam, that I think it's... um. And I truly want that mindset for everyone at Prudential. And I'm sharing this because it's so important for me to get that. If you don't start there, then everything you're doing sort of tends to, it's not working against the purpose of what you're trying to do, right? Um, you have to have clear accountability, right? Where are we headed? So within my DEI recruitment team, we kind of committed to that and we said, Every recruiter in talent acquisition should be diversity focused. They should be inclusive. They, sh they should adopt in equitable practices in how they recruit talent. But in the past few years, what we've also noticed is that recruiters don't have the time to set, you know, sign a contract with a diversity uh, uh, partner. They don't have time to necessarily um, go in to do pre-conference strategy to source talent. And so this DEI recruitment team that we have created helps create channels for recruiting diverse talent into our application stages, attracting them to Prudential. And, and we've set metrics against those funnels, not hires, against the funnels in attracting talent um, and are holding ourselves accountable with that foundation that we're all in. Uh, yeah, I mean, David, I know you've got lots to say on this, so I'll leave that question out there and to kind of add on to Tinia. Uh, I mean, I think you know, for me, you've got to go all in. I mean, diversity, equity and inclusion, I think, should be written into the DNA of all your policies, practices and procedures within an organisation. And as HR professionals, we have to be forensic about that. We have to make sure that the language is correct. We have to make sure where there is not inclusive practice that's stamped out as much as we possibly can. You have to make time for it, and and it is time. It really is. You know, making sure that you do have things like diverse um, recruiting panels or or, or interviewers, mm -hmm. making sure that every uh, external um, site, every thing on your website is indicating that you are embracing diversity, equity and inclusion. And I say that deliberately also as well, that it is all three of those, because quite often you get stuck in one or the other in, in many instances. Um, I also think, you know, for me, if you really want to advance these initiatives, 
I go back to again, and maybe this is because you know I've been intrinsically involved in leadership development for some time now. Is you have to make sure that your leaders are absolutely there as well. Um, absolutely. I, I I look at leaders as 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 it's great big massive signal generators within organisations. So you can have the posters on the wall, you can have the website, etc. But if those leaders are not congruent with the messaging, they are not uh, saying the right things. And I mean, what I mean by saying is believing the right things is fundamentally to their core quite quickly those strategies completely unravel i mean for me it really is important that you have the right level of education that sits in around those leadership teams to make sure they understand the power i mean is the real power of diversity equity and inclusion and accelerating performance innovation and creativity within an organization and the last part i i would say is that this world is not static either it changes all the time we we see new language coming through we see movements um right the way across the globe that provide greater focus on one of the diversity um characteristics for example so how do you build learning into that strategy how do you always make sure there's continuous improvement in there and things do go wrong and organizations do get things wrong but being honest about that and learning from it I think is absolutely essential if you really want to accelerate and deliver those results because people will see them you know they will they will feel it they'll talk to other people they'll put on Glassdoor they'll put on you know any kind of social media just you have to make sure it's part of your DNA if you want to accelerate it and do it 100% as Nia said. Yeah and I would say David it's just it's it, it aligns everything that you're saying aligns so well with some of the work that we're currently doing in Prudential. So with our North Star sort of being, okay, mm -hmm. in DEI recruitment, we want to bring in, but, you know, um, in an, we want to bring in diverse talent in an inclusive and equitable way. How do we do that, right? So we have three verticals to your point, you know, one that looks inward. Let's mm -hmm. look at ourselves first. Are we doing everything that we're doing mm -hmm. right? Are our leaders uh, holding themselves accountable? Mm -hmm. um, are we working, you know, are BRGs feeling enabled? Are we, um, do we have diverse interview panels? Are we um, equitable in our offers that we're putting out, right? So mm -hmm. all of that sort of internal audit is what, you mm -hmm. know, we, I think every company should be doing. On the flip side of that, it's the brand. How do we look outside in the market? Do we look like a company that believes yeah. in this, right? To attract talent? And then sort of the third vertical sits in the middle, which is our partnerships. How do we now take all of this and build strong partnerships internally and externally to actually get out there to do yeah. the work and execute? So I totally agree with you. And I think those are the three pillars for our DEI recruitment team, which is um, branding. It is looking at our own inclusive practices internally. Mm -hmm and then leveraging and building strong relationships mm. internally and externally to help drive that. I want to, someone's asked a question that I'm going to ask and, and you know, I'll ask you and, and I just want to cover that because I, I knew this was going to come up because it is, and we could spend, you mm. know, this topic is, is so big and wide and what have you. And before I get to that question, one of the things I think I've heard you say, and again, I think this relates back to all three of the trends and it's a behavior that isn't necessarily always in organizations and that's a joint accountability. So there will be a team driving something mm -hmm. because they are held responsible for making that happen. But unless you have accountability collectively, the change is much harder, right? And I think that applies to data analytics, like it applies to the employer experience and it certainly applies to DE and I, um, and, and that comes out strongly. And again, if I think back to for workforce advisory, when we talk to organizations, that accountability of having everyone you're held to the fire, not just this team who are doing their best efforts, that really makes a difference. Yeah, the, the question that's come in, and I think it was where you were talking, Simon, it's interesting, is, is people are asking what tools you use to measure. So if you're thinking through a funnel, or what are the tools that are you finding are really helpful in terms of measuring? Yeah, I will say the funnel for sure, because we we are on a quarterly basis, we take a look at funnels for our different organizations within the company to say, well, how do we look right now, right? So where are we doing better in terms of application funnels? But if we're seeing those percentages drop in certain race brackets or in gender brackets, we're asking ourselves, well, 20% of the workforce was, you know, 20% of, um, let's just say 50% females applied to a job. Um, but only 20% made it to the first round interviews, right? What is the reason for that? And then you almost have to get granular. You have to say, 
our, our job descriptions are attracting 50% female talent. So job descriptions are not the problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, how we're looking for talent is not the problem, but why are they not making it past the screening and the interview stage? So I would say that for us, funnels are huge. Um, we're also working very closely. So we do, uh, we're working closely on the source like the source of hires um, to track ROI from some of our partnerships. Um, we're working back with, again, so kudos to my HR technology team um, that helps us drive some of those, you know, um, links that I cannot speak to that they beautifully make for us, you know, that go out when we post a job and we're able to then track ROI from applications from specific job postings. So for us, we're using, um, we're trying to leverage technology from our first point to understand we're doing all of this, how are we tracking against those efforts? And so one is through looking at the postings and applications, but those funnels themselves are critical in really getting granular. Great. And I think my experience echoes that because it's such a big topic, you can end up doing lots of different things that feels everyone's got their sort of project that they want to do, because as we say, it's a hugely emotive, generally the intent is a really good one, but you end up not being able to see the wood for the trees. And so looking at those measures and then going, and you know, we spoke at the beginning around data and tech, you've just given a great example of who's getting what, why, what are they doing with it and what decisions are we making off the back of it? It's really purposeful in terms of where do we see something and how can we then make an intervention specifically around that rather than sort exactly. of general, you know, everyone's got a view. David, have you got anything you wanted to add to that? Um, I, I, I suppose for me, I, I always think about what's that massive transformational purpose. And I think it's less about, it's about how you, how you translate that into something that really gets the business to stand up and see where the power of diversity, equity and inclusion is. And I think, you know, the more we try and help the businesses understand their part in driving performance through inclusion, equity and diversity, that's the role that we play in, in, in this space here. And then we just need to be, as Nia said, just forensic at each stage of the contacts that we have with employees both internally externally that we are applying the DEI lens to that to make sure that we're not doing anything that is inadvertently disengaging our talents inadvertently disengaging external talent or com saying completely that's the wrong thing that you know could cause us to have issues I'll just have one last thing and I swear I'll stop after Sam um I think that um it's also important in this process to be brave um, it is mm -hmm. not almost every day I have a conversation with someone saying, mm -hmm. well, is that, is that right? Does that feel mm -hmm. right? Or should we be doing it this way? And so I think looking at the data to the question that was mm -hmm. asked, right, would funnels really tell the story? And where many times you're going to have to go back to the executive leaders and say, you want to do the right thing, but mm -hmm. you're like you're not if you want a change if you're not. you have to yeah. change yeah. Right? Yeah. you have to change your yeah. hiring practices if you want to see a change yeah. and so you know you can't ask for the you know you can't ask for something different but refuse to change the mm -hmm. way that you're thinking and your mindset so i would just say that use the data use the tools but but just know that you're going in for a battle sometimes and mm -hmm. it's okay because this space requires you to be brave yeah i agree i think there was a question that came in just around why are we still talking about this in an HR space? And absolutely right question. I think that's what we're saying. It's it's okay. not an HR space, but often our teams are own some of the processes and the ways that we can actually make a change. And so that's why it often sits with us, but that accountability doesn't. It sits, it sits okay. across the whole. I, I, I think our role is to agitate the change. That's what we're here to do. It's, it's, it agitates, use data in a powerful way and then give the tools to the leaders to be able to do this correctly. That's that's the role I think that we play. Yeah, I'm just aware we've got 10 minutes. Um, people are sending in questions, that's, that's great. I'm having a look and I will go back and see, uh, make sure I answer most of those, or if I don't, that I will make sure that I will follow up with, with each of you. Um, I guess one of the things I wanted to say, and again, Nia, you said this, be brave, right? It's It's fascinating to me because we look at 
I don't think anyone would dispute the data that's been consistent over many, many years now that mm -hmm. says diverse teams have a much better chance of, of being high performance teams, right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of, that is what it is. It comes from, it's validated. It's been from all kinds of places. It's not like we can dispute that. And yet when you are pulling together a team, it goes back to what data and what are you thinking about in your decision making? And again, I'm going to bring back that behavior of purpose led. Are you thinking about diversity when you pull together a team? Or are you focused on a skill set that could be trainable? And how are you thinking about those things in what is going to get you a better performance? Kind of not just in the short term, but in the, in the much longer term. And that has to be ingrained into a way of working. And those questions, as you say, Nia, at the right times based on data, to put that in and say, hang on, why are we making the decision right now? We seem to have a lot of those that have a lot of this and we're asking for more. Why would that be the case? Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I want to bring up, and then I will I'll just go and check the questions and make sure I've answered them. I think we spend probably, in my experience, when I talk to organizations about this, gender, ethnic minorities comes up probably as the most common. Um, I am I am hugely passionate about uh, neurodiversity. So it's kind of an interesting thing. And when we're talking about digital skills, 20, 25% of the population is neurodiverse. Wow, like how are we being inclusive in those kind of things? So I wanted to get your perspectives um, and then I'll leave five minutes to make sure I've answered all the questions just on the breadth of pillars and not just to, David, do you want to go and then, you know, would love yeah, your view. So, so my thoughts on this is that it's, it's yes, yes, and, 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 you know, we, 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 when quite often when we're thinking about diversity, we think about it in those protected characteristics and quite often people are a wonderful mosaic of lots of those characteristics and we can't think in the binary. We need to start to think about actually how do we create the conditions, the environment for people to thrive and 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 be the best they can be and bring and bring that diverse the diverse perspective whether it be gender race sexuality religious belief disability etc 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 all the wonderful things that people bring to the party how do we help them bring that and use that as a strength in decision making and innovation and for me you know too often we spend too much time in the D space and it's great you absolutely must do it but actually don't forget that unless the environment that sits around you enables those individuals to bring their whole self to work you're unraveling all the great work that you're doing so I definitely don't think we should be forgetting that you know women are 50 percent of the population they are it's proven time and time again disadvantaged because of their gender certainly the more senior they get in the organization you see less and less of them continue that stuff but don't forget the and the and the and and the wrapper that puts around that that would be my perspective perfect Nia, what would you like to add i would just like to say that it's it's true yes and i agree with that as well what you just said sam but i think that again there has to be an intentional effort in this space so if you are going to do it right veterans for example um, you know, we have done a huge push at Prudential to really push forth some of our programming for veteran hires, um, whether that's through the corporate fellowship program, whether that is working through some of our RPO partners, such as Ronstadt, uh, for, um, you know, with the Wounded Warrior Project. So there's a, there, it's all baby steps is what I say. And while I agree with you that there has not been um, I don't think that we talk about some of these other pockets of identities as much as we do, you know, female and ethnic minorities. Um, we have to figure out a way to intentionally make those efforts to see the outcomes that we're doing um, or say we're not going to do it right one way or another. But, but we can't say that we want to do it all and then not deliver on it. So I think that you're right. Um, we are sort of in that space, but I think we do need to make a larger effort in some of the other pockets as well. Yeah, Great. definitely. And, and it's not about tokenism. It's not about putting a pride flame, uh, a rainbow on your website for one month of the year and then forgetting about the other 12 months of the year. It's not about, you know, yes, we may have one building that is has accessibility, but it's about how, how accessible are your 
facilities, your website, etc. All, all of those kind of things, you have to do it and do it do it well wherever you possibly can. Or be honest about where you can't. And there are, we, I know we've had conversations in the past, Sam, over accessibility of you know, bathroom facilities and buildings, etc. You know, where it's not available, we have to be honest about that. It's, you, you can't wave a magic wand all the time, but people appreciate, I think, honesty and transparency and you know that's 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 a, a good starting point and then give hope to do better in the future great so we have four minutes and there's a question that i um i, I will um give some view on it as i said if you've mm. asked a question and we haven't answered it i will certainly um i will with the wonderful team um, behind me who i said thank you in the beginning uh, follow up with all of you um i think there was lots of questions on dei which there always is which is great and amazing the question actually came in and um curiosity around how we are pulling all these different kinds of talent together, not just from a diversity perspective, but gig workers, all of the different types of talent we see emerging across uh, across um, organizations and across the globe. And I'll give a perspective of what we what we see out there. There's certainly a need and a conceptual want to do that. Often structures and organizations don't lend themselves to bringing that together because it sits in different parts of organizations. So where we see people really getting traction and organizations getting traction on that is even if it sits in different parts, not ideal, what is the goal? And it goes back to that saying, what's your purpose? Are you thinking about, we need to find amazing people in our organization to do great work. How do we prioritize our work? How do we redefine what work is and not just a job with an output? How do we think about that? What are strategic priorities? And what are what are priorities when they come up? Because sometimes things change. And how do we deploy people in that space? We see people experimenting and testing in that space around a skills framework. We see people thinking about, okay, so it doesn't matter what kind of talent then, I'd like to just have the base. So how do I bring that data and technology infrastructure together and moving towards the concept of how do I look at supply rather than just a demand-led workforce plan and my colleague who I work with very closely will be very pleased um, it's definitely that that we see people moving to this isn't just I want this wish list these are the locations I want them in and this is what I want them for that's nice you probably can't have that is there there's the answer no matter who you are so what is out there what is in here how do we work that what's the upskilling and reskilling you do no one has got that puzzle together yet However, there are organizations who are starting to get pieces of that puzzle mm -hmm. really together. And we are starting to experiment and co-design with those organizations to pull the pieces of the puzzle together. So that is my three second answer on a very kind of interesting topic. But um, we have one minute. I want to say thank you so much, Nia. Thank you, David. Um, I really appreciate. I know it's it's. It's, it's lovely to come and talk about it, but it's also super important that, that people hear you. Thank you for everybody who's joined today, who's interested, who's got curious mind, because that's part of being in HR. And um, I wish you all a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day, whether that be morning, afternoon or evening. And um, please go to randstoyad at sourceright.com if you'd like to access the full report. And there's loads of other reports in there. And you can see, please connect with us with LinkedIn. We, we're keen to hear from you.